Welcome to the Parenting with Impact podcast with your hosts, Elaine Taylor Klaus and Diane Dempster, co creators of ImpactParents.com, an online community, award winning blog, and service organization helping parents all over the world to raise complex kids become capable, independent adults. Hi, everyone. Elaine and Diane here. And we know that you want your complex kids to grow up to be happy and independent. And yet you're not always sure how or when to help with that. In this podcast, we'll encourage you to collaborate with all kinds of complex kids and support them in navigating life and learning. And we'll interview leading experts from around the world, as well as parents in our own community, talking about how training for parents actually helps these complex kids. We'll talk about the issues we hear parents struggling with all the time and how a coach approach can support and empower your amazing young people. We won't tell you what to do. We're going to help you figure out how. So let's move on to the next conversation. Welcome back, everybody, to another conversation in the Parenting with Impact podcast. I'm really psyched to have this conversation because there's been a lot of attention being raised in the last year or two about inattentive ADHD, and that's happening largely because of the two women we're about to have a conversation with. I want to welcome Cynthia Hammer and Dr. Kristen Wilcox. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. We, you will be able to read all about them in the bio. But I'm going to let them, I'm going to dive right in and let them tell you why they're here. So, Kristen, let me start with you, if I may. Like, Mm -hmm. what brings you here to this moment where you're having a conversation specifically about inattentive ADHD? Well, um, I have a son who was diagnosed with inattentive ADHD when he was in third grade, which is pretty early to be diagnosed with inattentive ADHD. And I'm just trying to increase awareness about inattentive ADHD overall and also in boys because it is uh, under-recognized in boys. There's not much information out there for parents and educators about this type of ADHD in boys. Well, so, and I just want to highlight what you're saying before we move to you, Cynthia, because there's two things you said that are really key. One is we tend to think of inattentive ADHD regarding girls, not boys, more commonly identified. Um, But you also said that it was early by diagnosing it in third grade. And most people would hear that and go, well, third grade doesn't sound so early. But what you're saying, I think, is that for boys with inattentive specifically, it's often missed. Yes, because uh, my son was not hyperactive, so it's not picked up in kindergarten, first grade. And we were fortunate he had a teacher in third grade who recognized his symptoms because she had a son who was a high schooler Mm -hmm. at the time with inattentive ADHD. So, Cynthia, what about you? You've recently started an organization to raise awareness to inattentive ADHD. What brought you to this work? Well, I got diagnosed myself when I was 49, and then I ran a nonprofit for 15 years trying to educate adults about ADD. But during the COVID crisis, I wrote my memoir, and I, part of it was about ADD, so I went back and learned. And I read a blog post by a young girl who was so angry she didn't get diagnosed with her inattentive ADHD. People saw there were problems, and they just didn't recognize it. So. Somehow that got my juices flowing and I, it was, you know, I was 77 years old and I said to myself, I mean, we need to do something about this. And then I kept saying, well, if not you, who? So that's got me started to start a new nonprofit that's focused on inattentive ADHD because we, we've learned that both boys and girls don't get diagnosed as early as the children, probably the boys that are hyperactive. And their average age of getting diagnosed is seven. So the mission of our organization is we're going to get the inattentive children diagnosed by age eight. Wow, that's a beautiful mission. So for those listening, 77 years old is not too late to, to find your passion and pursue a mission and make a difference in the world. So I really want to honor you for that work. That's a really powerful message. In addition to the work that you're doing. So let's talk about, we've kind of set the stage. What's the difference between inattentive ADHD and hyperactive ADHD? Let's start with that just really cursory so people listening can understand really specifically what we're talking about. Kristen, do you want to sort of tackle that? 
Uh, sure. Well, uh, there is a lot of crossover between the symptoms. They have disorganization. They have problems with memory. But the, the biggest difference is that they also both have problems with focus. The biggest difference is that inattentive type very rarely has hyperactive behaviors and impulsivity. So these kids kind of fly under the radar at school and they're the kids that are maybe looking out the window or in my son's case, you know, shoving worksheets in his desk that he didn't (laughs) want to complete because he didn't like English class or getting up and disappearing to the bathroom or the nurse's office. You know, these kids are not the ones that are, you know, bouncing off the walls and getting up in class and blurting out answers and being disruptive. So, you know, they're thought of as being more lazy and apathetic when really they're they're not. They have inattentive ADHD. And that means they're really distracted. So let me set the stage framework wise. There is ADHD is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. I hate the word disorder, but I'm going to use it for the moment. And they used to have a difference between ADD and ADHD. And then a number of years ago, ADHD became the umbrella term for all of the inattentive issues here. And there are two types, or three types actually. There's the inattentive type, which is what we're talking about today. There's the hyperactive type, and then there's the combined type. And I think the majority of kids who are diagnosed with ADHD are combined type. And so we see that hyperactive behavior. It's usually one of the early signs that people are responding to. And what I hear you saying, is that the kids who don't have the hyperactivity but have the inattentiveness are often missed, one, because they're not being disruptive, and two, because there's kind of a judgment of, of well, they don't care or they're apathetic. Correct. And so they're kind of getting missed. Their diagnosis is getting missed. Cynthia, what would you add? Well, recently I read comments from adults who weren't diagnosed as children and they had those labels of being unmotivated, lazy, um, and to read it, even as adults, how hurtful these comments were because they were trying so hard and no one was recognizing it. They just perceived the child in a different way. And I was just astonished at how old someone could be and still have that hurt from those earlier comments. Well, I think it, it, it creates, you know, as an adult who was also diagnosed as an adult with ADHD, you have this self-concept that you get as a child from the messages you've gotten from the adults around you, and it sticks. It's really hard to undo that. We do a lot of work with positive intelligence to help people kind of reframe that internal dialogue around what we call saboteurs in the coaching world. But those voices that tell us that we're not good enough, we're not worthy, we're not trying hard enough, all of those inner judges are reinforced by those messages we get from the outside world. So I I hear what you're saying. I think it it does continue to hurt because it's this internal dialogue. We we adopt it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I think beyond that, though, they wonder why people even use that language to start with. I mean, if the teachers were trying to motivate the child to criticize them in that way, wouldn't be that motivating. So whether it's not a kind way to talk. Yeah, for sure. And I think we understand that now from a modern lens that, that, you know, 30 years ago, that was seen as an effective way to motivate. And, And what we've learned in coaching is, unfortunately, sometimes it is effective. It's not constructive. It's not healthy. It doesn't feel good. And it causes a lot of other psychological damage. But it actually, part of the problem with that self-talk that beats ourselves up is that that's how, as adults, I know, I don't know about you, I'm curious, that's kind of what we have learned to do to get ourselves to get anything done sometimes. Were you always kind to yourself or did you struggle with negative self-talk before you grew to understand what was going on? Boy, that's a hard question to answer because I have such a poor memory of how my life was. (laughs) You yeah. know, so you'll have to read my book to know that I have <laughs> problems and I don't know what my self-talk was, but I know I did things that made me very sad. So, yeah, yeah I, I don't know if I went around saying I'm defective, I shouldn't uh, be doing, I, I don't know if I had that kind of talk, but I just know when I got diagnosed with ADD at 49, I was totally shocked. 
And yeah. So, you know, you, you live your life not thinking there's anything the matter, and then you find out, oh, yeah, you, your life could have been different, and you could avoid these problems if only you had known something sooner. But for me as an adult at 49, I felt I was one of the first adults learning about it. And so there wasn't an opportunity for me to learn when I was younger, although I think my parents saw stuff in me that they were concerned about. Like my sister and brother got their driver's license when they were 16, but my parents didn't let me get mine till I was 18. So mm -hmm. there must have been some reason they, they did that. So I'm hearing that so clearly that there's this, you know, when you're diagnosed as an adult, you, there's a woulda, coulda, shoulda. You look back and say, what could my life have been had we known this earlier? And I think that's really common for adults diagnosed with any kind of attention issues is first we have to mourn the loss of, of the life we thought we could have had to embrace what it is to manage who we are. And I, I often try to say, let the diagnosis be a boon, not a bust, because now that you have an explanation for what your challenges were, you can learn to manage it and do something about it. Kristen, what would you add? Well, I was just going to add to your last statement. You know, even though my son was diagnosed pretty early, I think he felt that. He mm -hmm. felt better when he realized, you know, that he had ADHD and he could start working on it. And, you know, we worked hard together to, you know, get him to acknowledge what his limitations were, but also what his, what were the positive things about his ADHD and where he could excel. So I, I think having that support, you know, he's really appreciative of that. He actually came home his last day of high school and looked at me and he said, thanks mom for getting me through school. <laughs> you know, wow. because He's going to go to college now um, to a small college that caters to um, his interests in aviation and aerospace, which I'm hoping will be a good fit for him. And he'll be able to, you know, thrive there and, and stay there. But, you know, he's very aware of what his limitations were. And to Cynthia's point with the Inattentive ADHD Coalition, getting these kids diagnosed early is critical because they can start working on it. They can start helping themselves. They can realize, you know, what their limitations are and what they have to do about that, but also what their passions are and what their gifts are and where, what areas that they can thrive. Yeah, for sure. So let's talk a little bit about the Inattentive ADHD Coalition. I don't want to make this all about that, but you referenced it. So let's at least tell people what it is and what you're trying to do. Well, the, the name of our nonprofit is the Inattentive ADHD Coalition. The website is iadhd.org. And our board decided the single most effective thing we could do, being a small organization, is to focus on educating teachers and school counselors, school social workers in the grades K to 5. So that's been our focus. And right now I'm sending articles and a child questionnaire we created out to um, these school counselors, state organizations, hoping they'll put it in their newsletters. And we're creating videos that will be on our website starting in October, ADHD Awareness Month, that are especially geared to teachers, letting them know how to recognize children with ADHD, making them aware of what happens if these children don't get diagnosed early, and uh, hearing from adults who... I explain how they wish they had known earlier and how it would have impacted their lives. And so, so, so can, let me interrupt you for a second and just ask you to speak on this and either of you to speak a little bit on, you know, you focused on the schools. One of the things that surprised us when we started doing this work over a dozen years ago was how little education mm -hmm. most teachers get about attention issues and, and ADHD. Absolutely. So speak to that a little bit, Kristen. Well, I it's interesting you mentioned that because my sister-in-law is a third grade teacher and she's a teacher in Ohio. And I asked her, I said, how much education did, did you get about ADHD? And, you know, what, you know, do you have to take courses every year to kind of keep up to date since it, it does affect, you know, so many children? And she said, no, she said, you learn about it in your education classes in college. And she said, if you want to learn more about it, you can do that independently. But there's, there's no information out there for teachers 
um, and parents too about, you know, ADHD and the myths about it and what's really going on. And, you know, and I think that's a shame because like I said, my son has been pigeonholed as being lazy because people Mm -hmm. don't understand his ADHD. You know, he's had some teachers that did understand it because they educated themselves and they were phenomenal with him in helping him in the classroom. And then he had yep. other teachers who just didn't, couldn't be bothered with hearing about it, you know, didn't really, weren't really interested in meeting with me and learning about how he learns. So I think it is critical to get teachers educated about ADHD. Well, you said something just then that I think is really key, which is that part of our role as parents and, you know, from all of what you said, when we started Impact, it was originally Impact ADHD, now Impact Mm -hmm. Parents. It was because there was all the support out there for kids and there was very little available for adults. Now Mm -hmm. there's, I would say, a lot available, thankfully, for adults. We've been part of that. A lot of our colleagues have been part of that. And there's attention now turning to, well, what about the educators? What about the teachers? Because Mm -hmm. part of recommended treatment for kids with ADD is for the teachers and the parents to become educated and informed about how to manage it. Behavior management is the term that's used, behavior therapy. And there's just not a lot of support for teachers. And what I'm hearing you saying is that your role as a parent was to advocate and was to offer information to teachers. Some of them were receptive and some were not. Absolutely. I actually emailed my son's teachers at the beginning of every semester when he got uh, probably in starting in seventh grade to say, this is how he learns. These are the accommodations in his 504. These are the most important accommodations in his 504. Cause you know, mm-hmm. almost every kid that has a 504 or an IEP, it says, well, I have to sit next to the teacher. Well, you know, <laughs> can't really have 15 kids sitting next to the teacher. So I get that. And interestingly and surprisingly to me, the majority of teachers were very receptive to my communication and very appreciative of my communication about my child to them and my supporting him at home as well. So I was a little surprised about that, that they were that supportive, you know, because I emailed them every Friday and said, does he have any tests? Does he have any assignments that are missing? Does he have any, you know, projects? And I asked them if it was okay if I emailed them every Friday, to which they, you know, they said yes, but they were very receptive, you know, to me doing that. Did that change in high school? Did you begin to enroll your son in learning how to advocate for himself? I did that in the beginning of high school, but probably the end of his junior year, beginning of his senior year or through his senior year, I pushed him to advocate for himself. And, you know, you have to be the one to email your teachers and say, you know, I I see this assignment is missing. Can I have a few extra days to turn it in? Or you have to be the one that initiates asking for extra time on something if you need it. So, and, you know, when he was doing all of his stuff for college, he initiated all of that himself, but he's also very excited to go to this college. So I think Mm -hmm. there's part of that that plays into it as well. Well, understanding motivation is a key part of understanding how to manage ADHD, especially yes. inattentive ADHD, yes. right? So we teach a framework, actually, and I'll put a link in the show notes to this article called Pinch, which is the five motivators for the ADHD brain or for you know brains that struggle with an executive function. And, mm-hmm. and when you help them find that motivation, mm-hmm. then it's amazing. You know, we hear about these kids all the time. Well, they only do what they want to do. Well, mm-hmm. that's because that's the way their brain is wired. They they yes. do what their brain is motivated to do, what they can get the, you know, the serotonin to do. Yes. Cynthia, what would you add about the relationship between parents and teachers and schools? And, uh, you know, I think your experience, Kristen, is that teachers are hungry for this information. I would Cynthia, agree. They were very receptive. What have you found with the coalition in terms of of how teachers are responding? We just started just this past year, and I I think that there's a growing awareness of how damaging it is for adults to go undiagnosed. And I'm hoping that message gets out there more that we end up with health problems, we end up with social problems, emotional problems, uh, substance abuse problems, poor education, poor employment. And I just feel like that message needs to get out there more and more. 
And there is actually a project now called ADHDevidence.org where he, they're going to be focusing on what is the best treatments for ADD because, again, people are jumping on the bandwagon to provide things that might not be that helpful. And it's good to get the very best information about what, what are the best treatments for ADHD from a valid source. So have teachers been responsive to what you've been doing in the last year? I know it's still fairly well, new. I post to like almost 40 groups and some of them are special education teachers. Sometimes they'll accept the post, sometimes they won't. Sometimes someone I, uh, will email me as thanks for sharing. So, you know, that's the only kind of feedback I'm getting. Still trying to figure it out. I got it. Attitude Magazine is and is writing more about inattentive ADD. Now we're going to have an article in Chad Magazine this month that that's um, Attention uh, Magazine. Attention, yes, Just, and it will yeah. include the child questionnaire we have. I encourage any parent who's wondering if their child has ADHD to go get that child questionnaire because it is based on the DSM-5, but it gives a lot of a specific examples. And I know when my son was getting diagnosed, I'd read some descriptions of ADD and it sounded like him, and then I'd read other things that didn't sound like him. So often the symptoms of the hyperactive get conflated with the inattentive, and it makes it very hard for a parent to say, oh, yes, this describes my child. But if they look mm -hmm. at the questionnaire, I think it would help them to be more confident. And sometimes... Yeah, I, I hear from parents a lot. Well, my kid doesn't have a, a they need to be confident hyperactivity. The doctor, so they can be assertive. Yeah, so, so parents, you know, because you were asking about the response from the the teachers, and Cynthia mentioned, you know reaching out to groups with special education. So my son and I wrote a book about his inattentive ADHD called Andrew's Awesome Adventures with His ADHD Brain that talks about his experiences with his inattentive ADHD and also uh, my insight in raising a child with ADHD. So I did reach out to the various school systems in um you know, my state. And I will tell you that the, the special education and, you know, the heads of psychological and behavioral departments for students, um, they, they were interested in having the book and putting it in their resource library. So, so I do think it's making an impact to contact and reach out to these special education, you know, heads and also the, the teachers and the, you know, behavioral specialists for the schools. So I, I do mm -hmm. believe that, you know, getting this information out there will have an impact. Yeah, and it sounds like there's a lot of receptivity that you're finding. So believe it or not, we are at time. I told you this was going to go super fast. So let's start to finish by letting people know how to find out about you. So there's there's a book that we're going to have a link in the show notes. And again, it's called Kristen Andrews' Awesome Adventures with His ADHD Brain. Great. So it doesn't say inattentive in the title, but it's really about a, a boy with inattentive ADHD. Uh, yeah, it has a subtitle that includes inattentive. Got it. But, you know, it gets kind of long. Excellent. <laughs> it's, yeah, on, it, it, it's on Amazon, so... Yeah, and we'll have the link in the show notes so people can go directly to it. And then, Cynthia, the coalition you've started, the inattentive coalition is iadhd.org. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Awesome. So if you're looking for, for resources, information, if you a good book for kids, and I think Kristen sent me the book and, and we've had some conversations about it and, and I've read it and it's it captures a lot of what it's really like to live with inattentive ADHD. And it's lovely because it's really done from the view of, of mom and then son and then mom and then son. So it's got mm -hmm. a nice kind of energy to it. I really enjoyed it. Let's wrap up this conversation. I, I want to give each of you, Cynthia, let me start with you, an opportunity to either highlight something we've said or share something you feel like we haven't mentioned that you think is important for parents to understand. Well, I did interview 24 men that had inattentive ADD and they weren't diagnosed till they were adults. And when I asked them about whether they wish they knew earlier, one person said, 
I would only have known earlier if it was described to me in the right way. So I've always been thinking about that is what is the right way? Because in an adult, I don't, it doesn't bother me to think there's something wrong with my brain that medicine helps to fix. But a, for a child to learn that, it could be, I don't know, damaging to their self-image, I guess. I mean, I don't feel challenged that I have to wear glasses or that I have allergies and take medicine. But, you know, somehow people think if there's something the matter with your brain, it's really a bad thing. So that uh, you're going to put them in the links. But there are two people who have written articles about how to tell your children about their diagnosis. And I think that is a key thing for parents, no matter what kind of diagnosis your child gets, is to learn the right kind of language so they don't feel demoralized, but they do feel enabled. Because everyone who has ADD, no matter who I've talked to, they've always said, I always felt different. And yes. so the child, you're not telling the child something they don't know. They already know they feel different. And you're giving them an explanation about how this difference can also be a value. Great. So we will add in the show notes the links to those articles about how to talk to kids about diagnosis. And we have a couple from Impact that we'll add there as well. I often say, as I said earlier, I use the term, make it a boon, not a bust. If we don't give kids an explanation for what's challenging for them, what they're going to make up is a whole lot worse. And they're going to make up that they're lazy, crazy, or stupid. So we really want to give them an explanation without making it an excuse. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I think we're, we're... I might disagree, Cynthia, is I don't even see it as a deficit. I see it as a difference, a different brain wiring. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think there's something wrong with my brain. I think it's wired differently, and it's not always wired for maximum effectiveness in the world that I live in in the moment, but it sure does allow me a lot of creativity and a lot of other great stuff. So, and and I think that's the work that both of you are doing is really highlighting how to play to the strengths of those differences. Kristen, what about you? What would you wrap with? So I would say, um, I think it's important for parents to learn how to work with their child's ADHD brain. You know, they don't think like you, they don't operate like you. I spent a lot of time before I really understood my son's ADHD saying things like, you know, why can't you just do your homework? Why can't you just get in your room? Why can't you just put your bike away? It's not that difficult. Just put it back in the garage. How difficult is that? But for him, it was extremely difficult. And it took me a long time to understand that he couldn't just do those things that he needed help or it needed to be done you know, a certain way, like his idea of organizing is throwing stuff on the floor. (laughs) That's not my idea of organizing. So, you know, coming up with ways to, you know, help him do various things or, you know, learning that I couldn't just say to him, go clean your room. Because if I say that to him, there's no way he's going to do that. But if I say, make your bed and put your clothes in the hamper, and I'm very specific, he can do those things. And I would say another thing that parents need to realize is that your child is not choosing to behave that way. They don't want to fail class. They don't want to get in trouble for not, you know, cleaning their room. That's, they're not making that choice. They can't help it and and they need help and they need support from you as a, a parent and for you to educate yourself as a parent to learn how to work with your child's brain. Yeah. And the only thing I want to add to what you said, because yes, yes, yes to everything you just said, is that if you are an adult who also has ADHD, that doesn't necessarily mean that ADHD is going to look for your kids like it does for you. So just because yes. so what, what I heard you say, Kristen, is, you know, get to understand your kid's brain because it's different mm-hmm. from yours. Even if you have ADHD, it could very well be different from yours. So Absolutely. Don't beware of falling into that trap that, well, it works for me this way. So this is how it's going to work for them. Because every person with ADHD needs a very individualized way mm-hmm. to learn how to navigate mm-hmm. their, their brain. Cynthia, it looked like you had one more thing you wanted to add before yeah. we close yeah, out. One thing I read, well, sometimes teachers say we tell the parent we think the child might have ADD and the parent doesn't want to hear it. They're afraid Mm -hmm. of their child getting labeled and Mm -hmm. the stigma. And one comment I read, this woman said, sure, which is better, 
um, being called ADD or being called lazy, unmotivated, selfish, and self-centered. So the child exactly. ends up getting labeled. Yep. Which labels do you want them Which to Which do have? you want? <laughs> yeah. No, I'm with you. Otherwise, lazy, crazy, stupid does not feel good going through life. So, and, you know, and I was a kid with both with combined type and definitely didn't, everybody kept telling me I was smart and I didn't quite believe it. I thought I was fooling them. I thought it was really stupid because if I were smart, I would have remembered what I needed or what I had studied or, you know, mm -hmm. there were all these things that I just didn't understand. And, you know, as an adult getting diagnosed, as Cynthia will attest, it, it takes some time to get your head around it and learn to, to accept it and embrace it and navigate it. Yeah. So I appreciate both of you for the work that you're doing and for this really useful conversation. I'm really glad to have this targeted conversation about inattentive ADHD. Uh, we'd like to close the podcast with a little, with something sweet or light or fun or not, whatever it is to do. But I'm going to ask each of you if you have a favorite quote or motto that you'd like to share with our listeners. Cynthia, can we start with you? Well, I put out a mem every week, and this one got the biggest response, but I know it's going to irritate some people. But we find people out there who are very proud that they manage their ADHD without trying medication. And what I said is people who are proud they manage their ADHD without trying meds may be missing out on an earlier life. And we've learned now that medication, especially stimulant medication, if you get it at the right dose and it's the right medicine, it's the most effective treatment of ADHD. And it's more effective than any medicine for depression, any other condition. So you're very lucky if you have ADHD and you find a medicine that helps you because it truly can be life-changing and be the foundation of moving forward in a new life. Yeah, beautiful. So we will get that meme from you and, and get it included. And information disclosure, I also want to say that medication can be really effective for about 70 or so percent of the population. And then there's another 20 to 30 percent of the population for whom it's not mm -hmm. effective and other kinds of management. And for everyone with ADHD, behavior management is key to really using the medicine to its maximum advantage. So you know, pills without skills don't get you very far. Well, and I think what you said earlier, Elaine, is that I didn't realize how important parent training is. Mm. You know, you have a, a child with a special condition and learning how to interact with that child is key. Yes, truly. So, Kristen, you bring us home. What's your favorite quote or motto? So I'd say my motto would be to celebrate the, the positives in your child, um, you know, embrace that they're adrenaline junkies. You know, my son wanted to jump out of an airplane for graduation from high school, you know, and, you know, kind of reinforce those positives and, and create a path for them where they can excel using those positive attributes of creativity and problem solving and, you know, I enjoy watching my son truly live life because he's he's not afraid to do something. He just he jumps right in. And that's not me. <laughs> I'm the opposite. And, you know, I, I, I love that about him, that he takes chances, that he just mm -hmm. you know plows forward and, you know, worries about it later, which is not always a good thing. But, you know, he 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 will really enjoy life. So I think we need to celebrate well that. Instead of just focusing on their, you know, the negatives of their ADHD. I love that. Yeah, there's not a right or wrong way to live life. Nope. And um, when you have ADHD, inattentive, hyperactive, or both, there are all kinds of beautiful aspects of it that we can mm -hmm. embrace and celebrate. So thank you for that. Thank you both, for again, for the work you're doing in the world for this really enlightening conversation. And to those of you tuning in, thank you for listening. Thank you for your attention to yourself and to your kids. At the end of the day, you make a difference. Take care, everybody. You've been listening to the Parenting with Impact podcast with Elaine and Diane. For more information on the Impact Parents community or to join Sanity School for Parents, please visit impactparents.com. If you like what you've heard, please share this podcast with friends who need similar guidance and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. 
For the essentials of Elaine and Diane's coach approach to parenting, download a free tip sheet at impactparents.com slash podcast. Behavior therapy training for parents is actually recommended as a first-line treatment for complex kids. For information about Sanity School, our training program for parents or teachers, which has helped thousands of families around the globe, visit impactparents.com slash sanity school. 